All right, Preston, you want to do the first one? Sure. So uh, overview of the class, we've got uh, this kind of segmented in four sections. Uh, first section is going to cover just some basic wormhole etiquette. Um, it's going to be pretty short. Just talk about what you should do when you're in a wormhole. Second segment is going to be choosing the right wormhole. So we're going to we're going to go over some basics of how wormhole works, um, choosing the right one, mass, time wise, etc. Uh, third section is going to be nomenclature for book, for bookmarks. So this is something that's kind of important. If you ever give bookmarks off to an FC, we want them to follow a certain nomenclature so that we can easily follow where they go. And finally, we're going to touch briefly in the last slide on some useful resources including um, some tools that we use to help mapping our scanning. A lovely reminder down at the bottom, we are not teaching you how to scan in this presentation. Uh, so as much as I would love for you to stick around, if that's what you came for, that's not going to be happening in this class. We'll have to do another class on that another day. All right. And remember, anything worth doing is worth doing right the first time around. All right, so wormhole etiquette. Uh, wormholes are a nifty, sneaky, scary place uh, if you've never been inside of one. You'll notice probably one of the first things, other than the fact that it looks kind of weird in there, um, is that your local chat doesn't show any numbers of people that's in there. Uh, that's kind of a big thing. Uh, there's actually a little bit of anonymity when you're inside of a wormhole. There are some things that you can do that will mess that up for you and will let people know that you're there. Uh, so I'm going slightly out of order here, but uh, if you talk in local, it will pop your name up. Everybody that's in local will one, see your comment, and two, see your name, be able to right click on you, show info, and see that you're from Horden, that you're inside their wormhole. Um, that's not good for us. We use these fleets to attack gigantic capital ships. That means that they're not always the best at dealing with something fun like a sword fleet. Uh, which is a whole bunch of interceptors. So if for some strange reason there's a bunch of goon interceptors inside the same wormhole with you, if they start scanning for you, they might find all your uh, battle cruisers, and I promise you they're going to win that one. Um, second part, don't forget to change the name of your ship. For any of you that have never noticed, uh, the first time you get into a ship, it will rename it with your first and last name in EVE, uh, followed by an apostrophe, and then it will give the type of ship it is. We can't avoid the type of ship because that shows up on DSCAN, but if you rename the ship, at least it won't have your name, which can then be searched. Also, really important, whenever you go through a wormhole, wormholes have a specific amount of mass. Uh, your propulsion mods, uh, your afterburners, and your micro warp drives will increase the amount of mass that you have exponentially, uh, which causes more mass to be consumed off the wormhole which will possibly prevent the rest of your fleet from either getting into you or will end up rolling you guys into the wormhole and getting you stuck with no way to get back. So please remember, don't use your prop mods. Uh, so whaling fleets are nifty. Like I already said, um, we use those to go and hunt rorquals, uh, sometimes other caps. If we can find a good carrier that we think is uh, AFK and sleeping at, behind the wheel while he's ratting, or a um, dread that's doing some uh, ratting inside of a wormhole or in a uh, secondary null system. So typically we're looking for a null sec wormhole connection uh, to a destination that's usually south and east from where we usually are. If you guys don't know where Horde lives, uh, we're up in the northwest section of your um, map when it comes down to EVE. So uh, we don't mind looking for a couple extra wormholes in order to get to that null set connection. You'll find there's a whole bunch of wormhole types. We'll go through those in a little bit. Uh, but important to know, our wormhole fleets um, have a minimum absolute minimum uh, total combined mass of about 600 million kilograms. So that means that any hole that we need uh, to use has to have a max stable mass of at least 2 billion kilograms. That way we can keep track of the fleet going in and then the fleet coming back out. And then we can also account for any extra jumps we have to move back and forth. Also, if it's been used by other wormhole users, we're not going to see that mass change until it's moved past 50%. Uh, so that means we're going to be looking for wormholes that fit uh, both large and very large type ships. There's also some nifty sh uh, wormholes that only fit medium 
or uh, very small or the smallest of ships, I think is how they phrase it. Uh, that's not going to fiddle battle cruiser through it. So they have to be at least large size for that. And then we need obviously the same max stable mass. Uh, as general rule, FC dependent, uh, the FCs won't use their wormholes if they have less than four hours remaining on their lifespan. We just can't guarantee whether or not they'll be able to be there when we need to come back. All right. So let's get into choosing the right hole, because that's why we're all here, and that's an important thing to learn. The wormhole info screen is a uh, nifty little thing, and Pris gave me a nice screenshot for here. And so it will show you all sorts of good information. It's going to tell you the type of wormhole, where that leads, how much life is left on it, and then the mass. And we're going to go through each of those in a little more specificity in the next coming slides. All right, Chris, you're up. So as we are looking for these holes, you're going to see a whole bunch of different codes whenever you get to a hole. If you see a K162, that hole is an exit hole. That means that it was spawned from the other side. You will see a lot of K162s because they're just a generic exit. Any hole is going to have a K162 on the other side of it. On the other side of it, you will see an actual wormhole type. These are all the wormhole types in this nice little infographic here. As you can see, the ones that have in the furthest column to the right are our null six spawns. So if you are in our space and you see a hole that is one of these spawns, that means that it spawned in our space and it is going into a wormhole. If you see one of the other types, uh, K162, for instance, in our space, then it could be one of these other ones. Uh, typically, it's going to be most commonly, we're going to find uh, X702s, those go to class three space. And 432s, those go to class 5 space. U319s are less common, those go to class 6. And really, the, um, the, the dream hole, and we don't get too many of these, are S199s. S199s go direct to null sec. There is no J space intermediary. So there, when I say J space, by the way, that's all wormhole space starts with a J. So if you ever see anybody say J space or K space, J space is wormhole space, K space is known space. Uh, so typically what you'll want to do is just kind of get an idea uh, based on this infographic of what you're looking for. Again, S199s, U319s, and N432s are the ones that you really are going to be kind of your bread and butter. Um, all of those are 3 billion in mass or more. Um, any of the ones that are in yellow on here, B499s, um, any of the e E545s, those are a little bit more common. Um, they are, they're only two bill of mass, so that's a little bit less, where it's still okay for whaling, but any other hole type that's in either red or white on this infographic is no go. It means that it has less than one and a half billion, typically less than one billion of total mass, which we could not get a whaling fleet into and out of because we would mass the hole on our first jump. So destination types, when you get to a wormhole and you right click on it, even if it's a K162, meaning, meaning that it's an exit, you'll see a sentence and that sentence will see, say one of six different things. This wormhole leads to unknown parts of space. That means it's either a class one, class two, or class three wormhole. This wormhole seems to lead to dangerous unknown parts of space. That's a class four, class five. Deadly unknown space is a class six. And then the other three are pretty self-explanatory, high sec, low sec, and null sec. So if you get to a hole and you see that it's unknown parts of space, chances are pretty high that it's not necessarily going to be good for whaling. However, in, there is one exception, as on the previous slide, the E545 that I mentioned is a class two spawn. We do get a fair amount of those. So and they are 2 billion in mass. So those can be good holes if that class 2 happens to have a higher class static in it. And we'll explain that in a second as well. Let's go to the next one. So the other piece of information that you'll see is related to time. Uh, you're not going to see it very often, but the very first one is the wormhole has not yet begun its natural life cycle of decay and will, should last another day, meaning that it has more than 24 hours. Ever since they nerfed wormhole lifetime uh, a couple years ago, there aren't too many holes left that actually last more than 24 hours. 
Um, most of the ones that we get, the N432, the S199, those ones that I was talking about, those are 16 hour holes. So typically what you're gonna see is the wormhole is beginning to decay and probably won't last another day, meaning that it has between four and 24 hours left on it. Or you're gonna see the wormhole is reaching the end of its natural lifetime, meaning that it has less than four hours on it. The only time that we have ever used a hole, and this is again, FC dependent, that has EOL on lifetime is when we know exactly within 10, 20 to 30 minutes of when it went EOL. And then the final one is the wormhole is on verge of dissipation into the ether. To be honest with you, I've never even seen that because it's, it's minutes potentially. So I've only seen that once in my two years in the EVE now, uh, and it was actually a couple of months back. Um, it does exist. It's just, it's very sparse that you'll actually end up seeing that. Uh, to answer a quick question, yes, that infographic is available as a reference. It will be in this wormhole lovely presentation that you guys can access whenever you need to. Uh, it's also going to be on the video that's being recorded, and Chris has it in his other slideshow. Or not his slideshow, his... Um, Chris, help me out here. Forum post. Forum post. Thank you. Uh, so keep the questions coming, guys. Uh, we will finish them up at the end if I don't interrupt to finish them here. So final thing, uh, piece of information that you can gather um, besides the whole type is that how much mass is left on it. So there is... Um, three different designations one is over 50 percent one is between 10 and 50 percent and one is less than 10 percent that is has not yet been has had its stability and then has had its stability critical so if you ever get to a hole that's critical that's no good so even if it's a three billion hole that means that it only has three three hundred million left on it if it's a three billion hole and it is in that 50 10 to 50 percent range we don't know if it's between three million or 1.5 billion so that's another thing that we can't really take because we're not sure how much time, how much mass is left on it. Over 50% is really the only thing that we can take for whaling because that's the only thing that will give us enough mass for the fleet. All right, let's talk about naming your bookmarks as you find them. Um, it's a little bit tiny, but for those of you that have really nice big screens, you'll be able to see it down in the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, so first thing first, do yourselves a major favor, a major favor, words tonight. Um, go ahead and make a folder of your personal bookmarks. You can do that by going into people and places um, and then creating a new folder. And then name it so that you can see it when you open that right-click menu. And you can quickly identify what you're looking for. That's why I use that uh, TAC WTAC designation. Every time I also have TAC DTAC for, you know, Instadocs and... TAC, S TAC for safes and all that fun jazz. It's just a, it's a quick thing that jumps out of the list at you so that you know what you're looking for. Um, please, please, please don't make corp bookmarks. Uh, there are only a finite number of people that can delete them uh, unless you've created it yourself, in which case you can delete it. Um, but those people are getting sick and tired of deleting the corp bookmarks. And so we're just not gonna have any more because they won't delete them. So there won't be any more space. CCP has restricted the number of corp bookmarks you can have. Uh, it just has to do with keeping things tidy on their end. And to be quite honest, you really can't blame them. Uh, so anyways, once you have found your wormhole, uh, we're going to put it together in this very particular format. And we'll go over it with that little infographic down in the lower right-hand corner. So you know the signature followed by a tack. You're going to designate the wormhole type. And then in parentheses, you can always put what that actually means to you in terms of where it's going. Uh, for example, that N432 goes where, Pris? A C5. Okay, so in parentheses next to N432, you could put parentheses C5, and that way you know where it went. And then just give it a little arrow, and that's you know your real designation to, hey, this is where it goes. In this case, it's a C5. Um, once I've actually jumped through, I'll go back and I'll edit that bookmark to the actual specific J space number of where it's going. But that's a personal preference thing. This format right here though will help you out immensely so let's talk about where to actually get this information from so if you guys look down at that infographic the probe scanner on the left hand side the signature id is uh boxed off in red right there and that actually reads oub it's probably a little tiny for you guys to read it and so that's where the first part comes from it's going to come out of your probe scanner 
off it's the first three characters of the id signature and they will all, always be alpha characters there will be no numerical characters there the second part is the wormhole type if you show info on the wormhole it's going to right up top next to the uh, infographic for the wormhole it's going to say wormhole and then it'll say n432 in this case in that blue box sometimes it'll say k162 that's the back side of a wormhole sometimes it'll say s199 and then the third part is where you're headed um, this wormhole seems to lead to and it's the same stuff we gave you on the previous slide it'll tell you if it leads to low sec it'll uh, it'll say low security space it'll tell you if it leads to null sec it'll be you know null security space it'll tell you if it goes to high sec and then those um, descriptors for unknown types unknown is c1 through 3 and then it'll give you you know additional qualifiers for each one so this is dangerous unknown it ends up being a c5 i think and we already know that because it's an m432 which goes to c5 oh god i ran away with it all right so let's talk about some useful sites um this first link is really awesome. If you guys want to click on that, go for it. It should open up in a new tab for you. And that will allow you to go ahead and select any type of wormhole that's in existence. It'll tell you a little bit of extra info um, based on, you know, max stable time and whatnot. Uh, but it'll give you all that stuff that we just gave you in a little bit cleaner of a format if you're having a rough time deciphering the wormhole information. Uh, so you'll see from top down, if you pick any one of those random ones, it'll give you the max stable time. That's how long the wormhole is going to exist for. It'll give you the max stable mass. Uh, max mass regeneration. I don't think I've ever encountered a wormhole that does mass regeneration. Have you, Chris? I cannot remember one, no. Okay. So probably not a thing. And then there's another little part there that's kind of important, which is the max jump mass. It's the maximum amount of mass that can transit through a wormhole in any one go. That is the particular uh, number that is of concern when you are attempting to establish what class of ships can go through them. Uh, and then it will give you the same general messages, and then it will actually specify out the numbers for each one under mass uh, for each specific hole, if you happen to have to look it up, because you don't remember. And trackers. All right, Bruce, let's, uh, let's keep it brief. This actually went a lot faster than I expected it to. So, so Cole and I are both a little house divided on this, but I will say that my preferred tracker is Tripwire. Uh, we do have a corp mask set up in Tripwire. And what it is is basically a mapping tool, and both of these are mapping tools that allow us to share with each other what we have scanned, where it goes, what signatures, everything is. Um, so it's very useful if you have a bunch of people scanning to be contributing to a tool uh, that we use to figure out um, what's left to scan. So if I log into Tripwire, for instance, I can see pretty quickly um, what the options are on the table at the moment and what probably needs to be scanned. Um, same thing is fairly true of Pathfinder, although there are uh, admittedly fewer people contributing to Pathfinder. Some people prefer its interface. Um, there are positives and negatives to both. Where I feel Pathfinder excels is in the ability to visually map the uh, data plots. Tripwire doesn't really do a great job of being able to show visually where all the connection points are. It's a little kludgy like that. Um, whereas one of the benefits of Tripwire is it's a little bit more stable. Uh, it doesn't kind of bug out for quite as many people. Um, so, you know, you'll find if you end up joining the Wormhole Scanners channel, which I'll give a plug for um, in a second, um, that Probably more than half, I would say, use Tripwire as their primary platform, uh, and then there are probably a handful that are using Pathfinder. So, and I will. My intention is to follow up with an, a video to that I'm going to record to actually give a um, a walkthrough of how to register a Tripwire account, as well as use that as a tool. Um, it's not really something that I think requires a class. Uh, probably just a video is fine on that. All right. Shall we do questions and answers? Because I'm sure we didn't cover. Oh, sorry. I think we should mention both of those tools are public to the corp. 
So if you contribute things in there, that means that everybody in the corp can see it. So if you are out and you find a good whaling hole, generally you might want to remove it from the tracker because you don't know who else might be looking. Um, other things are pretty usually pretty good to keep in there. Um, we can kind of cover that later, though, in the Q&A. All right. Sounds like a plan. So we're on to questions. Uh, I'll pull them up. We'll check and see if you have your question answered once we've finished with our explanation. If not, we'll give you a little bit more to it. Um, please feel free to keep typing them out, and then we can go into a little bit more of an open question and answer if we have to. Uh, so first question popped up a little while back. Uh, what's the difference between dangerous unknown space and deadly unknown parts of space? Uh, it's a pretty simple difference. It's back on, uh, it's a few slides back, but that's fine. We won't pull it right now. Uh, the dangerous unknown leads to class four or class five wormhole space or J space. And the deadly unknown leads to a class six uh, wormhole type space. And I guess we could probably do with a little bit of a descriptor on what the uh, classes mean for us. Sure. So um, class one through three are going to be um, kind of various different attributes to them. So class one is almost, I think, almost always has two static connections. So when we talk about static connections with wormholes, that, it, that means that if you go into wormhole, it is always going to have a connection to another either wormhole or case space of a certain type. So for example, if I jump into a class two hole that has an E545 static, it typically also has an N062 static as well, which goes to a C5. That's one type of a wormhole. Wormholes are divvied out into constellations. In each constellation, all of those wormholes in that constellation have the same um, statics. So moving up from class one through three to class four and five, what makes class fours pretty significant, pretty unique, is that they do not have statics that go to K-space. And they always have statics that either go to a lower class and a higher class. So class fours are kind of like the go-betweens, because if you get into a class four, you're almost always going to find it goes to one of two other wormholes, either lower or higher in class. Class fives typically only have one static um, and that is usually either to another class five which is an h296 a class four or a class six the class six i think is a v911 i don't remember what the class six, three is the class six holes are there are the fewest of the the class six holes as any other type which means that most of them are occupied so when they say deadly known space, what makes them particularly deadly, besides the difficulty of the sites contained within, is that you may find that they're occupied by big wormhole corps like Hard Knocks or Hole Control or one of those guys. So, you know, tread carefully when you go into a Class 6 as it's likely to be occupied by a larger corporations. One of the reasons it's occupied by larger corporations, by the way, is that the, the sites contained within a Class 6 require a pretty significant amount of fleet or ships, sometimes capital ships, in order to do those combat sites that are contained within that hole. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk about with class. Oh, um, I wanted to talk about roaming holes. So roaming holes are the types that you'll come across that are just random spawns within uh, a particular space that aren't their static. So whenever you're in a, in a wormhole, you're either going to have one of basically three different types of holes. One is going to be a case 162 from somewhere else. Another is going to be the static for that hole. And you can always find that out by um, looking at the wormhole in either one of the tools that we mentioned, Tripwire or Pathfinder, or just looking it up on um, Google. I think in the Alatha database, it has that information. The third type is that wandering hole, and wandering holes are just randomly going to be generated within uh, space. So if you're in a class five, you may find a wandering hole called a Z142. That Z142 is a nullsec connection, mm -hmm. but it's not guaranteed to be there. Uh, you, you might also find a C140. That's a low sec connection. So again, not guaranteed to be there, but typically most class five and class six holes will have 
one or two wandering holes in them. So if you jump into a system like a C5 and you see that it doesn't have any static to anywhere you want to go, chances are it probably does have something to somewhere. I, I would say that maybe 20% of the time I'll jump into a C5 and it only has the one static. The other 80% of the time it's got connections to somewhere else. All right, Legacy. I'm hoping we more than answered your question. Are you all set there? Yes, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. All right. I know you just talked a lot, Chris. Um, so I'll take this one. Uh, Dust Love, how close do we usually perform to be from 7RM or GME? Um, we're moving a large battle cruiser class doctrine. Uh, ideally, they warp a little bit faster than your standard battle cruisers, but we don't want to move them, say, any more. I'd, I'd really argue probably no more than seven jumps, Chris. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think the general rule that SET gave was around 10 uh, within 7RM or GME. Basically, you want to mostly focus on our space. And also, you can include jump bridges in that, but I wouldn't go necessarily 10 out of 93 PI, for instance. Maybe 10 from 7RM. But, um, you know, if, if it's something in, say, Mantinal, which is through the RQH, you could get to that through the RQH jump gate, which technically is only two jumps from 7RM. But for the most part, 10-ish jumps from one of our hubs. Awesome. The fewer the better, obviously. And Chris wants to know, is there any way to use the personal map and tripwire and then move it into corp later? Unfortunately, no, there is not. You, there is no data import or export. I believe that is possible maybe in Pathfinder, um, but there is no import or export with tripwire. Ultimately, this ends up being okay because it really only matters if you can visualize the pipe and you know that it's stable, as long as you can hand those bookmarks over to a competent FC. Uh, they don't need to see the pipe as long as the bookmarks are there for them. Right. You all set with that one, Chrysa? Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, there's a fleet up, so I'm going to go. Uh, I'll catch this later on the video. Thanks. Awesome. Atticus. Are you still here? Hi, OC. I had to go, and now I'm back. That's okay. Atticus, I have linked for you in Mumble a uh, sex post on whaling. We're not going to discuss the fleet comps any more than saying battle cruisers, um, but they're all listed out in that lovely post. There. Hello. Hi there. All right. And last question that I see for now, uh, Chris, we're going to have to do an abridged version of this answer. <laughs> um, it's probably best to just read the post and I can link that because it's it's fairly complicated. Zkill doesn't have an advanced search fe feature, so you end up having to edit the URL to add the ship type and the region that you're scanning. Um, so I would say check out the uh, What Makes a Good Whaling Hole post. It's inside that sec post on the second page. I can get you a direct link to that if you like, uh, but that goes into more detail on how to look on Zkill to find a good whaling site. All right. Any other questions? I guess I will say, in general, you know, we're, we're mostly looking, as he said, for stuff that's kind of to the southeast, northeast, pretty much areas that aren't controlled by giant block uh, alliances like Goons and Test. Although we have been known to run whaling fleets in their systems, we're far more likely to get dropped with supers in those. Kind of our bread and butter is Malpice in the regions uh, surrounding it. Uh, so that's kind of dr the drone regions in the northeast of the map, um, but also some to the south. How cool. about the culture? What was that? How about the culture? Are they too strong alliance or just uh, middle ni nimble? I didn't. I didn't understand what you said. He wants to know about the culture. Oh, the culture. Um, I I don't know that they we've really seen much work activity from them. No, they tend to stick to their subcap doctrines most days. To be quite yeah. honest, um, 
but yeah, I mean, if they've got Rourke's out, we're all for going after the culture too. 